Universitaire Saint Justine. He's an associate neurosurgeon uh, at the University of Montreal Hospital Centre, an associate professor at Université de Montréal. He's a surgeon scientist, Saint Justine Research Centre. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, I know this was a last minute invitation, particularly for a surgeon, and I appreciate your time and um, yeah, your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe, uh, for this the, the, the invitation. Um, I'm very, uh, very honored to be here uh, with uh, some great speakers and great talks, uh, both with yourself, your community, uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Hypothonic Hamartoma Hope Foundation. Uh, really excited to be speaking about uh, surgical aspect of, of uh, treating patients with hypothalamic hamartoma. Can you confirm that you guys can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Um, yes, now it looks perfect. Okay, great. So, um, so uh, I do I do have the disclosure of being um, a consultant for Monteris Medical, which is one of the uh, one of the manufacturers that that uh, produces and and uh, and offers laser ablation uh, treatment for for epilepsy and other disorders, including hamartomas. Um, the objectives of the talk today uh, uh, will be to really go into what is the role of surgery for patients with hypothalamic hamartoma, um, and specifically, when do we want to consider surgery? What are the surgical options available to treat patients with hypo hypothalamic hamartomas? Why do we do surgery? What are the goals that we're trying to achieve? And in looking at the different surgical approaches that we have for, uh, for patients with hamartomas, uh, what are the relative indications, uh, advantages, disadvantages, and, and very importantly, what, is the, what does it mean uh, for a patient to undergo a, a certain procedure? What, is the, what are the risks and, and what are the benefits that they can uh, get from, uh, from each uh, procedure? And uh, with the goal of sort of opening up our receptors and, and, and uh, for, the, for the rest of the talk, I wanted to present this case, uh, a patient that we treated three years ago here in St. Justine, a four-year-old girl who had daily gelastic seizures uh, since her first year of life. She also had very rare um, uh, fo uh, focal impaired awareness uh, seizures. Uh, and then over the course of the last year prior to her presentation, she started uh, developing, uh, as has been eloquently uh, described, the behavioral uh, disorder with rage attacks and also cognitive decline. And so, you know, how would you describe this hamartoma, and uh, would you recommend surgery? And if so, what approach would you rec would you recommend? And uh, in speaking with the patient and, and her family and caregivers, what would you uh, cite as the likelihood of uh, improving her seizures and uh, improving the comorbidities associated with her hamartoma? And finally, what are the risks of the surgery that you would propose? And so, um, we've seen greatly uh, from the prior talks. Uh, the uh, natural history of hypothalamic hamartoma. And of course, uh, while anterior hamartomas uh, typically can cause uh, endocrinopathy, uh, precocious puberty, it is really the more posterior uh, located hamartomas uh, connected to the mammary bodies and, and fornices and uh, medial hypothalamic nuclei that tend to cause epilepsy, typically gelastic seizures. And um, under medical management, unfortunately, the majority of these patients go on to having a uh, quite disabling clinical course, uh, consuming, uh, con consisting of drug-resistant epilepsy, and of course, and uh, uh, eventually develop a uh, uh, severe ep epileptic encephalopathy with cognitive decline and various behavioral and neuropsychiatric issues. And what I wanted to highlight uh, here was that um, uh, these patients have a critical window with which surgical intervention can really transform their lives by uh, either preventing or reducing uh, the, both the epilepsy and these uh, 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 disabling comorbidities. And so really the goal of surgery is yes, of course, to either cure or, or reduce seizures, both gelastic and non-gelastic seizures, but in doing so to treat these uh, comorbidities associated with this uh, syndrome and through that to improve the quality of life of these patients. And when we look at surgical treatment of, of these patients, uh, like in all epilepsy surgery, but I think hypothalamic hamartoma is the uh, poster child uh, 
condition for uh, an, ep an epilepsy surgery uh, in the sense that when we approach these, these conditions, we look to balance the benefits with the risks. And in particular, we, we look to uh, reduce the risks of both approach-related morbidity and morbidity in resecting the epileptogenic zone. And so um, both reducing uh, uh, post-surgical neurological deficit, uh, deficits associated with the approach and the target are, are important considerations. And we, when we speak about the target, of course, hypothalamic hamartomas are uh, eloquently located and surrounded by uh, very crucial neuro, neurovascular structures. Uh, if you look, uh, they're intimately associated with the mammillary bodies and fornices, the hypothalamic nuclei, uh, the thalamus and basal ganglia, of course, the optic apparatus, midbrain, and, and pituitary, pituitary gland. So, uh, um, these structures are, are critically at risk during uh, various surgical interventions that we can propose. And uh, as surgeons, and of course, as also as neurologists, we have to be intimately uh, aware of these structures and how to preserve them. And like any epilepsy surgery, the, most, the, the first step is to identify the epileptogenic zone. And we, we now know that uh, hypothalamic hamartomas are intrinsically epileptogenic. Uh, about 80% of the cells in the hamartoma are these GABAergic, uh, very small GABAergic interneurons that have this spontaneous firing capacity, almost like pacemakers, and, and, and they fire and connect uh, uh, onto uh, glutamine, glutaminergic uh, cells and are able to uh, generate, uh, uh, generate seizures. And interestingly, while there is some controversy, um, the, the, the border, the morphological border between the hamartoma and the uh, surrounding structure, so the hypothalamus and the mammary bodies, does also represent an electrophysiological border. And we know that the, this ictal activity within the hamartoma, hamartoma uh, can, can oftentimes be located really at the border, which is an important consideration when uh, approaching these lesions surgically with our goal being to disconnect it from the surrounding hypothalamus and mammillary bodies. And as had, was, was uh, eloquently shown, uh, the, these, these uh, hamartomas are uh, densely connected to uh, uh, critical limbic structures uh, through, uh, typically through the uh, mammillary bodies uh, to the mammalothalamic tract uh, towards the uh, hippocampus, but also through the fornix and, uh, 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 and, and through the mammalic tra mammal th thalamic tract uh, indirectly through the cingulum. And uh, we, we do believe that the propagation uh, of, of seizures arises through the connection from the ham hamartoma to the mammillary bodies and the hypothalamic uh, nuclei. And so when you look at uh, the disease course of these patients, uh, really a hypothalamic hamartoma and patients with hamartomas, uh, it's a, um, uh, a good example of a, of a, a kindling -like, like epilepsy. And these patients typically start, start off in their disease course with, uh, with, with gelastic seizures, uh, of course, uh, originating from the hamartoma and with their spread uh, to the uh, epileptogenic network that, that involves cortical structure, structures such as the cingulate or frontal cortex that are responsible for generating uh, this seizure semiology. Um, however, as the disease progresses, uh, uh, the ictal propagation pathways from the hamartoma to the extra uh, hypothalamic uh, structures generates secondary epileptogenesis in the cortical structures, uh, uh, typically the, the temporal lobe, the amygdala, uh, the cingulate. And uh, as, uh, as these structures become uh, secondarily epileptogenic, uh, patients' EEG patterns worsen, and we begin to see behavioral decline. At, in patients that, that uh, do not benefit from uh, timely intervention or surgical intervention, uh, un unfortunately, these uh, initially dependent extra hypothalamic cortical epileptogenic uh, structures become independently epileptogenic. And so uh, it's at that stage that we, we see a, a much worse uh, uh, disease clinically with more extensive EEG abnormalities and further behavioral and cognitive decline. Uh, 
and we can understand uh, the importance of uh, uh, assessing and understanding the epileptogenic network in these patients uh, when facing a patient with a uh, in the initial phase of the disease, uh, targeting the hypothalamic hematoma has a high likelihood of causing uh, seizure freedom and the patient is uh, likely to have a much improved quality of life. In the second stage where we are uh, in, in facing uh, dependent epileptogenesis, uh, targeting the hypothalamic hematoma and completely disconnecting it from the network is likely to uh, result in a running down phenomenon where there may be seizures persisting for a certain amount of time, but as these extra hypothalamic cortical sites are, are not independently epileptogenic, uh, seizures uh, would, we would expect to improve over time. However, in patients in whom the, uh, the, the network has become uh, more complex and the extra hypothalamic structures have become independently epileptogenic, we would not expect a good uh, seizure outcome following targeting of the hypothalamic, hypothalamic hematoma. And it's in these patients that uh, will sometimes eventually undergo uh, extra hypothalamic uh, cortical resections like temporal lobectomy. Uh, and, and we can potentially get good outcomes in, in those settings. And I think it's important to highlight, as has been said, that independent of what surgical approach you use, what comes across in, in most studies as the common predictor of seizure outcome and improvement of comorbidity is the duration of epilepsy prior to surgical treatment. And I think this likely reflects uh, the epileptogenic network that you're treating. And in patients with a limited network within the hamartoma uh, are likely to have a good outcome, whereas those in whom the network has extended uh, well beyond the hamartoma and become more complex with uh, multiple seizure types, these are the patients that typically have a worse uh, seizure outcome. And if you look at uh, uh, improvement of these cognitive outcome in patients treated for uh, hamartoma, and this is a study that utilized surgery and interstitial radiation therapy, um, the goal being to show that, uh, of course, they're heterogeneous uh, with varying degrees of uh, 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 deficiencies in, in uh, cognition, but with treatment, uh, a significant proportion of patients do improve cognitively, although it is quite heterogeneous, and you unfortunately have patients who do not improve, as well as patients that decline, and it's very possible that the patients that do not improve, improve cognitively and also behaviorally um, are the ones with the more later stages of the disease. By that same token, looking at patients who decline cognitively postoperatively, it is quite possible that uh, a significant proportion of these patients uh, decline due to uh, surgical morbidity. And of course, uh, the, the initial description of uh, hamartoma was uh, in the late 1960s. The initial uh, surgical treatment uh, be, prior to identifying the hamartoma as being intrinsically epileptogenic and the source of, of seizures in these patients was uh, to carry out uh, a cortical resection of frontal and temporal lobe. Of course, this, this approach uh, was ineffective in, in, in treating seizures, but it wasn't until uh, in, uh, the hamartoma was identified as the source of seizures, both invasively with SEG and non-invasively, that um, groups around the world began, began surgically targeting the hamartoma. And uh, we have the, the great honor of having Professor Palmini here. And uh, his uh, paper is, was a uh, landmark paper uh, in which the, and one was one of the first surgical series describing the outcome in the open surgical treatment of hypothalamic hamartoma, most patients through a bacterial approach. And uh, this landmark paper sh showed, was one of the first times where, where they, were, they showed that patients uh, had a, a very good seizure outcome following uh, surgical resection and disconnection of the hamartoma. However, they did highlight the high rate of morbidity in uh, over half their patients, albeit transient in many patients, there were a significant rate of, of stroke, stroking of diencephalic structures as well as midbrain, hypothalamic, and endocrine uh, injury. And so over, over the ensuing uh, two decades, we've seen uh, uh, an expansion of the armamentarium of surgical tools that can be, can be used and have been used to treat epilepsy surgery. And these tools have been used uh, for patients with hypothalamic hamartoma with the goal of obtaining uh, the same good seizure outcome seen with the initial experiences by, by groups like uh, the multi-center study uh, published by Dr. Palmini, but with 
the goal of reducing the morbidity associated with the uh, surgical approach. And if you look at the literature from, from a quick PubMed search, you can see that, uh, of course, there have been many papers on open and, and radiosurgical uh, approaches to hamartomas, but over the last, particularly over the last 10 years, there's been an exponential amount of, of groups publishing their experience uh, uh, targeting the hypothalamic hamartomas uh, minimally invasively. Now, when you look at the literature, uh, like much of the literature we, we, we have in neurosurgery, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, the, the quality of the data is quite poor. Most centers utilize an approach that is uh, based on uh, not necessarily data, but um, uh, their expertise, experience, or more importantly, the technology technology that's available in their in their region or country. Uh, most studies are single center, single arm, uh, non comparative studies with a small number of patients and a, a very heterogeneous patient populations with variable outcome and different criteria for assessing uh, success and morbidity. So it's very difficult to draw firm conclusions. However, we've attempted to to go through the literature and attempt to attempted to um, further our, our, our understanding of, of, of the risk benefit profiles of the different approaches we have for patients with hamartoma. And the, here, these are the approaches. So um, uh, there are, we could say four broad categories of, of treatment available, open resection, endoscopic disconnection or resection, stereotactic radiosurgery and stereotactic ablation. And when you look at open resection, uh, following the initial experiences with uh, the pterional approach uh, from below, um, several groups uh, advocated for a, uh, a interhemispheric uh, anterior interferniceal, uh, anter interfer sorry, ferniceal approach from above, with the goal of potentially reducing the morbidity. Um, in terms of the uh, terional approach, um, this is an approach where, if there's any neurosurgeons in the audience, uh, will know it's it's a workhorse for the for the neurosurgeon. Uh, it involves uh, frontotemporal craniotomy. Uh, and in the case of hypothalamic hamartomas, you, you can remove a part of the orbit, the, the orbital bar and the zygoma to uh, garner a greater access rostrally in the hypothalamus. This approach is ideal for type one uh, de la lande uh, hamartomas that are pedunculated in the cistern. And it has the advantage in addition to providing tissue of being a very short corridor and avoiding uh, the long reach and the morbidity associated with uh, sectioning the corpus callosum or potentially manipulating the fornices that is associated with the transcolossal uh, anterior inter uh, forniceal approach. However, of course, it does have several pitfalls uh, working in a, a narrow corridor uh, between the optic apparatus, the carotid, the third nerve, uh, of course, brings these structures into play. And uh, there are certainly risks of uh, injury to these structures. Uh, and, if, and one of the major limitations uh, is the uh, difficulty in uh, reaching above, uh, above the floor of the third ventricle. And it is uh, much more difficult to get a complete disconnection or resection of de la Lange type two, three, or four hamartomas. In addition, which uh, one of the pitfalls with this approach, which is also true for other open approaches, is it can be difficult sometimes to decipher uh, the margin between the uh, hamartoma tissue and the normal tissue of hypothalamus. You could conceive that this approach is likely the most invasive approach we have for uh, hypothalamic hamartomas. The transcolossal anterior interferniceal approach from above is, uh, is, is, is uh, better suited for uh, uh, hamartomas that extend above the floor of the third ventricle, so type two to four, and uh, really avoids the, the uh, exposure in the, of the cisternal structures that we see with the pterional approach it provides an excellent exposure into the third ventricle of the hamartoma. Uh, and of course, as mentioned, it, it brings into play uh, uh, the, for, the fornices, which uh, certain studies have shown are at increased risk of injury, particularly in older adolescents or adults as the um, septum pellucidum becomes more adherent. So it can become more difficult to separate the fornices. And one, one pearl to avoid injury to the fornices is to really utilize approach that's more anterior um, uh, as they separate naturally. And so we've, we've delved into the literature and, and uh, I have a great, uh, I share a lab with, with uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Fala, and we have some great students who uh, have recently delved into the literature and carried out a, 
meta-analysis with individual patient data uh, on hypothalamic hamartomas, specifically looking at surgical approaches. And when you look at uh, the literature on open approaches to hamartomas, we see that uh, the seizure freedom rates are excellent. And particularly when you compare to other types of uh, resective or ablative epilepsy surgery, more than half of patients are seizure free and uh, more than 70% have a worthwhile improvement of their seizures. Uh, as was mentioned, a quarter of these patients do require re-intervention. Uh, and if you, we, we sought to decide for whether a, a transcolossal uh, interferoneal or arterial approach was superior, and we did find that the transcolossal approach had a slightly higher likelihood of seizure freedom. Now, what, is, what does it mean in terms of morbidity? If you compare both approaches, there are differences. Of course, all this data that will all be presented is to be taken with a grain of salt as the, 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 the quality of the data is not excellent. Um, there is a significant heterogeneity and, and limitations. However, we were able to uh, demonstrate uh, that patients undergoing a pterion approach do have a higher rate of memory impairment and hypothalamic impairment than those undergoing the transcolossal approach, whereas those undergoing transcolossal approach have a high rate of endocrine dysfunction. And this has been shown in, in many different studies. And I think it is important to have an idea of the numbers and uh, open approaches harbor about a, a, a memory deficit in about a third of patients, which is a significant amount and hypothalamic dysfunction in, in uh, up to a quarter of patients. Uh, and so th these are important considerations when, when recommending surgery and, and, and I'll be showing other approaches, but of course, many, many centers around the world do not have access to some of the newer technologies. And so I think it's important to still uh, know these surgical approaches and have a good uh, understanding of their efficacy uh, and risks. And here's a case we did. This was in my first year of practice uh, my, that one, one of my colleagues uh, carried out an eight-year-old who had uh, daily seizures in this giant hamartoma. And uh, the patient was treated through an interhemispheric uh, transcolossal approach from above and uh, had a disconnection of the hamartoma uh, in its interface with the mammary bodies and the hypothalamus. And unfortunately, this patient did have a, a contusion injury to the midbrain causing uh, 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 sorry, oculomotor nerve palsy and hemiparesis, which has since improved. However, the patient does have, did have persistent seizures and we recently completed treatment with uh, uh, laser ablation now that we have that technology available to us. Given the high morbidity associated with open uh, surgery, uh, many groups started advocating for an endoscopic approach, which was sort of the natural progression in terms of rendering uh, surgical treatment of hamartomas less invasive. And in the early 2000s, several groups uh, reported their experience, and there are really two very large studies, one from Barrow and the other from, from uh, France, uh, that uh, showed that the endoscopic uh, transventricular approach to disconnect the hamartoma and or resect it uh, results in uh, excellent seizure freedom rates that are quite comparable to the open approach. Over 50% of patients uh, have a seizure-free outcome. And in the patients in whom a complete resection of the hamartoma is achieved, more than 70% uh, have seizure uh, has, ha have seizure freedom. Uh, this technique uh, is minimally invasive. These patients have a much shorter hospital stay than those undergoing an open resection, typically two to four days. Unfortunately, the minimally invasive nature and good seizure outcome does not come without a surgical morbidity. Uh, however, the surgical morbidity is lower than what we see with open approaches. Overall, 8% of patients undergoing endoscopic uh, resection and disconnection of hamartomas uh, have permanent morbidity. Um, the, the most common that we've seen in the initial studies, but this, the rate of this has gone down significantly in recent studies, is thalamic stroke. Uh, uh, usually these are small strokes that are asymptomatic and that can be um, induced by more aggressive resections that extend uh, too deep and that uh, inadvertently injure the perforators to the thalamus. Again, this approach is not without its morbidity. Uh, over 10% of patients can uh, unfortunately uh, uh, end up with hypothalamic injury and uh, increased appetite and obesity. And about 10 per, 8 to 10% harbor permanent uh, short-term memory loss uh, following surgery, which is about 30% uh, less than that we see with that is than that which is seen with open surgery, but is certainly um, uh, higher than other approaches like radiosurgery, which I'll show briefly. Uh, 
And finally, uh, the proximity to the midbrain is a consideration and uh, about 10% of these patients have uh, uh, wake up with hemiparesis, although the majority of patients recover. And so in who can we consider a endoscopic disconnection or resection of a hematoma? Really, uh, the ideal candidate is the uh, De Lalande grade two, although it can be performed for, for all uh, grade uh, uh, hematomas. But the ideal candidate is a, is a patient with a hematoma that's less than a centimeter, that's purely intraventricular, that's unilaterally attached to the hypothalamus. And it's important to have a working corridor below the foramen of Monroe as you enter the third ventricle. So you want at least six millimeter distance between the roof of the third ventricle and the superior portion of the hematoma, ideally. And you ideally also want a, a, a working distance between uh, uh, the hematoma and uh, the interventricular cistern. On the left, I've shown a case of a patient that I ablated who has a residual connection with the ham hamartoma and the hypothalamus. And this is a case whereby I'll probably go back and laser, but these are the cases that I would consider going back endoscopically to disconnect the residual connection. And this is the view that you'll see endoscopically. And so it can be challenging to decipher uh, the, the hamartoma from the normal uh, hypothalamic anatomy. However, in general, it is feasible. And the disconnection and resection is, can be performed with various instruments uh, you can debulk with a, with a small endoscopic rangeur, or, or you can disconnect with a, a monopolar or bipolar cautery, and other tools have been utilized by several groups uh, around the world. And uh, if we look at the literature, endoscopic uh, dis uh, disconnection of, of hamartomas results in very similar seizure freedom rates that we get with uh, open surgery. And... Uh, we, we, we've sought to look at the literature and identify which patients uh, are more likely to have a good, a good outcome. And uh, uh, those with a unilateral attachment, a class two uh, de la Lande uh, uh, hamartoma, and in particular, a shorter duration of epilepsy are, are, are more likely to, uh, uh, to have a, a good outcome in terms of their seizures. And these patients do uh, harbor the same benefits as those with open surgery in terms of cognitive and behavioral outcome. So the third type of uh, modality that we, we have uh, to treat patients with hamartoma is, of course, stereotactic radiosurgery, of which uh, uh, groups have used the gamma knife and, and linac uh, to treat hamartoma. I won't go into the details between uh, the nuances between both uh, techniques, but in general, stereotactic radiosurgery is a very good option. It's a non-invasive option and non-surgical, so there's no incision, and it's good for patients with small or medium-sized hamartoma. What's important to, to understand from a technical standpoint is, uh, like in uh, radio surgery for, for temporal lobe epilepsy or any other type of epilepsy, in general, you want uh, a 17 or 18 gray dose at the margin or your 50% isodose. And so the outer border of your hamartoma should receive uh, about 18 gray, and uh, you want to treat the entire lesion. These, this is what has been associated with the best outcome, but what's important is to avoid uh, radiation of these critical structures, particularly the optic apparatus and the mammary bodies, and the rule of thumb is to, to, to avoid uh, radiation and uh, uh, less than 10 gray uh, on the uh, optic tract is what is uh, sought. And uh, a quick slide here to show uh, the sort of landscape of the literature. Um, I won't go into details, but I would bring your attention to the excellent seizure outcome and once again, comparable to the other modalities. So uh, what's different in radio surgery is we do have evidence with uh, much longer follow-up and I'll delve into that. Um, what's with rates radio surgery from uh, the other disconnective or resective techniques is the delay in efficacy. And so it can take up to two years to have a therapeutic effect. However, uh, in long-term follow-up, the seizure freedom rates are quite comparable to those obtained uh, immediately after open or endoscopic uh, resection or disconnection. What's particularly interesting with radio surgery is the essentially inexistent rate of permanent morbidity. The, the largest study to date uh, in radio surgery is, was uh, by the group in Marseille, Jean Regis, and, and uh, they did a uh, prospective study looking at uh, uh, gamma knife treatment of hamartomas in 48 patients, which is the largest study in, in, in patients undergoing radio surgery. 
And I think it's important to look at which type of lesions are, were treated in, in their uh, series, but also across the literature. And uh, really the, the, the candidates for a radial surgery are, are patients with hamartomas limited to within the hypothalamus. So grade one, two, and three. And patients with uh, hamartomas that are uh, giant or extend well beyond the hamartoma are not great candidates due to poor efficacy. Um, like we, we see with the other types of surgical approaches, uh, many of these patients require additional uh, interventions and up to 60% of patients under, in their series had additional uh, ablation. However, they, uh, uh, following the second ablation, they obtain excellent seizure outcome. Uh, there is, however, a, a small uh, risk of transient increase in seizures. And, and uh, as has been mentioned, you generally want to wait up to at least two to three years uh, in order to ascertain uh, the efficacy uh, of a, a, a ablation uh, with a stereotactic radiosurgery. surgery. And uh, as, I, as I discussed, the, the permanent deficit rate is essentially 0% in this large study. There was a 6% rate of transient uh, 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 temperature disorder. And this improvement in epilepsy and avoidance of surgical morbidity, uh, both in terms of memory and hypothalamic injury, uh, translates in uh, improved behavior in a third of patients and improved cognition. And the results when compared indirectly to uh, cognitive improvements seen with open surgery, uh, there is some indirect evidence that radio surgery uh, uh, potentially does a bit better. And so, if you look at this case on the left of a type two hamartoma uh, that's limited to the hypothalamus, this patient is an ideal candidate, whereas this very large uh, type four hamartoma, uh, in which case uh, uh, my colleague in Sherbrooke uh, 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 did a disconnection, we can see that uh, the, the patient in whom the lesion was completely treated was seizure free, whereas this patient with a partial treatment or a disconnection has persistent seizures. Uh, Grade four uh, hamartomas could be seen as relative contraindications to radio surgery. It's, it's largely ineffective in uh, treating seizures. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, patients with hamartomas that are less than 15 millimeters or that are uh, type one to three uh, are the ones that you would want to consider as a candidate for radio surgery. Uh, the reason why type four, these giant hamartomas, are not good candidates. Uh, the, the size of the, of the uh, ablation that you would have to do would uh, cause a uh, fall off dose uh, that would damage the critical uh, structures, the mammary bodies, the optic tract. And so uh, in general, type four hamartomas are, are, are not considered good candidates for radio surgery. And here's a case uh, to, to illustrate uh, the technical aspects of uh, radio surgery. And in this case, uh, uh, treated by my colleague in Sherbrooke, uh, Dr. David Mathieu, uh, the patient initially had a uh, good outcome uh, as, the, as the lesion was completely ablated uh, with, uh, with radio surgery. Uh, what's interesting with radio surgery is while some patients like this patient uh, had a, can have a reduction in the size of their hamartoma, uh, the majority actually have no change in size of the, hammer, of the hamartoma. And, uh, there is a concept, because you're not destroying the hamartoma, there is a concept that your surgery is almost like a neuromodulatory, where it, where it, where it doesn't, necessarily destroy, uh, this doesn't necessarily destroy the tissue or cause uh, uh, necrosis, but potentially renders these, uh, these GABAergic interneuron-like firing cells less epileptogenic. And here's a, a case uh, uh, I want to show of a failure uh, to illustrate um, the limitations when the hamartoma is bigger in size, you can see that uh, the yellow here represents the 50% isodose. So that's uh, approximately eight, 18 gray that you wanted to reach the uh, outer border of your hamartoma. Or because of proximity to the optic tract, which you don't want to have uh, more than 10 gray, uh, this patient was unable to be completely ablated and has had persistent seizures. So, um, Stereotactic radio surgery certainly uh, is an excellent option for patients with type 1 to 3, but particularly type 2 hamartomas. Um, and th this approach is, is ideal for patients with, with higher cognitive function because it preserves uh, memory so well and cognitive function. Uh, in patients who are high functioning, uh, 
with already good baseline testing, uh, radio surgery is a very appealing option. And this is in particular older patients or young adults uh, with intact memory or milder epilepsy. And another consideration is uh, many of the patients that were presented by my, my esteemed colleagues where patients develop a progressive disease with uh, progressive epilepsy of multiple seizure types and worsening encephalopathy and worsening cognitive and behavior. Uh, these patients, we have a critical time window where we need to intervene in order to uh, improve or reverse the encephalopathy. And, and because of the up to two year uh, window whereby radio surgery may not be completely effective, these patients with worsening condition may not be the best candidates for radio surgery. And of course, it's non-surgical, there's no incision. Um, uh, and it, one of the real main advantages, particularly compared to uh, minimally invasive ablative techniques is that it's conformational meaning you're able to conform your ablation to the structure uh, and shape of the hypothalamus. And finally, the in, almost inexistent rate of permanent morbidity is a major, uh, major advantage. One of the main uh, considerations or concerns that, uh, that many of us have, clinicians, but also families, is the risk of malignancy. I won't go into detail other than to say that the large-scale studies that have been performed have shown that the risk of either uh, spontaneous uh, intracerebral uh, malignancy or uh, malignant transformation uh, are not necessarily zero, but they're uh, either the same or smaller in incidence than is seen in the general population. Finally, the, the, the more recent uh, uh, tool or technique that we have added to our uh, surgical armamentarium is stereotactic ablation. And stereotactic ablation really is uh, a minimally invasive uh, surgery, which definitely reduces surgical morbidity. You can see here on the right, uh, the uh, typical uh, incision size and, and approach of a minimally invasive laser ablation. And so these patients typically go home within one day, avoid ICU stay, and are definitely uh, undergoing a less invasive procedure than open and, and also endoscopic uh, dis disconnection of hamartoma. And what these minimally invasive, minimally invasive ablative techniques offer is uh, an improved risk benefit profile for the patient. And so because you're inserting stereotactically a 1.5 millimeter probe deep into the hypothalamus, uh, uh, you, you're minimizing the approach related morbidity or the potential damage caused by surgical man, man, manipulation along your approach. And because of the characteristics of these tools, which I'll, which I'll go into briefly later, you're potentially maximizing the damage at your target, so of your epileptogenic zone, while minimizing the damage of your eloquent perihamartoma structures uh, at the target. And so, of course, there are two types of minimally invasive ablative uh, technology, radiofrequency ablation and laser ablation. What is radiofrequency ablation? It's essentially the placement of a SEEG probe in the hamartoma and other extra uh, hamartomatous uh, tissue, uh, which allows you to record uh, 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 interictal and ictal activity. Uh, uh, and this, this is of course a minimally invasive uh, procedure which can be carried out at the bedside. And the SCG probe is essentially connected to a radio frequency wave generator. And when that generator is turned on and actioned, uh, radio frequency waves are transmitted through a dipole represented by uh, two contacts. And uh, the transmission of, uh, of uh, radio frequency waves uh, increases heat at the lesion, uh, very high up to 70, 70 degrees Celsius. And that heat causes uh, uh, thermal injury and, and necrosis of the tissue, in this case, the hamartoma. So this is, has the advantage of being minimally invasive, electrophysiologically guided uh, bedside treatment. However, unlike laser ablation, it is somewhat blinded. You're not obtaining uh, real-time feedback of, of what you're doing while you're doing it. However, the, the, the technique does have the advantage of, of having a, a, a very short interval between what's being ablated and what's not, which uh, contrasts it to radiosurgery, which has a much more progressive fall-off dose. And so here's a case that of a patient that I had initially seen in consult for laser ablation, but uh, due to administrative reasons, we weren't able to treat at our, at our hospital. And so I sent to my colleague, Jeff Hall at the MNI, uh, 
And this patient uh, was in his 50s, had had prior temporal lobectomy in his youth at the MNI. And then with the improvement in uh, MR imaging, they, they discovered this uh, uh, grade two hamartoma, which was uh, stereotactically ablated with radio frequency ablation. This patient has done excellent. He's a high functioning uh, professional and he's seizure free with no permanent morbidity. And so how does radio frequency compare in terms of efficacy to other procedures? It's as, as, you, as you might guess, which is a trend of this talk, uh, the seizure freedom rate is quite comparable to the other approaches. In our meta-analysis, looking at uh, the study level data of patients undergoing radio frequency ablation, just over 60% of patients are seizure free. And after one single ablation at two years, uh, uh, we see over 65% of patients are seizure free. It's important to note that in series where patients have undergone serial ablations, the rate of seizure freedom uh, increases. So like, like has been carried out with open ablation or radio surgery, many of these patients benefit from multiple, uh, multiple treatments and uh, in staging the procedure, we're able to increase the efficacy while, while limiting the morbidity. And I'd also like to highlight the relative lack, and you can see by the choppiness of this Kaplan-Meier curve, the relative lack of long-term data which is of course a pitfall in drawing firm conclusion. So what about laser ablation? Um, what is it? Uh, laser ablation essentially is the stereotactic placement of a, of a laser probe uh, within the hypothalamus. Um, you know, the laser is a, is a uh, harbors a light, emit, light emitting uh, 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 probe. Uh, it's MR compatible. Um, why are lasers interesting in medicine and particularly in neurosurgery? It's, it's a laser essentially is the emission of light at about a thousand nanometer wavelengths, so infrared. And that light uh, is uh, emitted in a accurate and precise fashion and coherent fashion. So uh, what, this, what, what that means is the, the, the light can uh, damage and irreversibly damage and cause tissue necrosis. But the fall off dose, the interval between tissue that is necros and tissue that is uh, uh, that remains healthy, it, based on animal studies, is about one millimeter. Of course, there is some variety in that, but taken together, as you can see in this patient who had an ablation of their hamartoma, because of the uh, precise nature of, of the laser, you're able to ablate the diseased tissue, the hamartoma, the epileptogenic zone, and preserve the perihamartoma. Uh, uh, structures. So in this case, you can see the preservation of the midbrain, the mammary bodies, and the optic tract. And, you know, lasers are interesting because we can uh, control uh, temperature uh, in a time-dependent fashion. And so we know that under 43 degrees, uh, no matter how uh, no matter how long or, or uh, you action uh, a laser, if your temperature is below 43 degrees, you will not cause irreversible cell damage. Uh, uh, whereas above 60 degrees, you will cause uh, instant denaturation of proteins and tissue coagulation. However, between 44 and 60 degrees, you can control the damage that you cause to tissue. So in this case, the hamartoma in time-dependent fashion. There are two companies that offer laser ablation. I won't go into any, any details, other than to say that um, there are uh, small uh, differences. In particular, the, the uh, technique on the left, which is uh, offered by uh, Monteris, has the option of having a, a side fire, which allows you to have a somewhat conformational ablation. Both techniques, uh, in addition to emitting light and, and, uh, 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 and increasing uh, heat, uh, uh, harbor um, uh, cooling mechanisms. One in the case of, of the visual ace, it's a cold saline, whereas in the case of uh, the Monterey system on the left, it's a CO2. But of course, lasers are precise. We know they can cause damage in a, a precise fashion, but um, how are you able to monitor what you're doing while you're blading with the probe within the lesion? And uh, this is really one of the innovations is MR guided laser ablation. And that's the uh, P P PRF MR thermometry or proton resonance frequency shift uh, MR thermometry. And essentially what that, what that refers to is as your patient is in, uh, uh, is in the OR with his laser probe, um, uh, he is thus then brought to the MR suite. And 
as the laser is turned on and the heat is increased uh, at, the, at the tip within the hematoma, the patient is inside the MRI magnet and you obtain um, a gradient echo imaging. And we know that as the temperature increases in brain tissue, there is a shift in the resonance of protons. As, as water molecules uh, disasso dissociate more, and, uh, and th thus there's a shift uh, that can be detected by uh, the MRI and through the software that's uh, commercially available by the uh, laser ablation companies, you're able to generate thermal maps. And these thermal maps, and I'll show one here, and you can see it here, these thermal maps provide you with in vivo, near real time, prediction of what the temperature is. You're not actually measuring the temperature, but the MR thermometry technology through proton resonance, fre resonance frequency shift is telling you what temperature it is. And because we know that, temper that reversible and irreversible cell damage can be predicted based on uh, temperature and time in, uh, in a very predictable way, the software is able to tell you the temperature uh, in near real time, but also predict whether you're causing reversible and irreversible damage. So you have real-time visual feedback of what you're preserving and what you're bleeding. So in this case, you see the yellow here is the reversible cell damage, whereas the blue represents the irreversible cell damage. And once you're finished the ablation, you can uh, obtain imaging with gadolinium enhancement, and you can see that the outer border of the gadolinium usually represents the outer border of your ir irreversible cell damage. And so just quickly to represent uh, a case of uh, laser ablation, this is actually our first case we did, I think it was in 2016. And so these techniques require stereotaxy. So in, in this place, patient, we placed the stereotactic frame. We then brought the patient in to the CT scan and obtained our frame-based CT scan, which was then fused to the pre-surgical MRI. We then verify our, our trajectory, uh, uh, our target, as you can see, this is a, uh, sh a shaveless uh, surgery. We, we don't shave. Um, it, it requires a four millimeter stab incision, after which time uh, we drill a small hole in the skull, perforate the dura, place our stereotactic bolt. And then once that's placed in the OR, the patient is either um, brought to the MR suite if, if, it's, uh, if there's no intraoperative MRI, or you can, in our case, we now have an intraoperative MRI, so we do it all in, in the OR. But once the patient's in the magnet, you place the laser, as was shown, through the bolt into the lesion. And with the patient in the MR magnet and the probe within the hamartoma, and as you are on the workstation in the control room, you're able to ablate the hamartoma and obtain real-time feedback. And so you can see in this hematoma, the optic track was drawn off in pink. And I'll just go back and you can see the MR thermal maps are showing us in blue, the irreversible thermal damage and in yellow, reversible thermal damage. So we're able to see in real time what we're preserving and what we're, and what we're uh, disconnecting or ablating. Of course, this technology is, uh, has, is minimally invasive uh, provides real-time feedback, but it does have its technical limitations. As you can see in this patient with a very round uh, shaped hamartoma, because the uh, laser ablation produces about a two centimeter elliptoid shape with, and, and because you're committed to the trajectory of your probe, you would not be able to completely necessarily ablate this lesion. And if you tried, you might uh, uh, harbor increased risk of damage to extra hypothalamic tissue um, surrounding the hamartoma. The same is true for this giant hamartoma, where you can see that uh, the risk in cases like this is to incomplete, incompletely ablate the epileptogenic zone. Because in each case, you're restricted to the direction of your probe and to the size of the ablation, which in general is less than uh, two, two centi centimeters, give or take. And so this is a disadvantage because you're not able to do true conformational treatment unless you use multiple probes with different trajectories. Uh, whereas in open surgery and 
and radio surgery, of course, we can have good control, conformational uh, uh, ablation. And to illustrate uh, the, uh, a bit the limita technical limitations, here's a patient six years old that uh, we treated. And you can see in order to obtain a complete ablation, unfortunately, the heat tracked up the probe a bit and, and did uh, uh, cause a, an anterior thalamic injury. However, this patient four years later is, is had a good outcome and has no uh, long-term permanent deficits and is seizure-free and doing great. Um, so I think this case uh, illustrates, illustrates very well uh, the limitations uh, induced by the elliptoid shape of the, of the uh, ablation. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that it's interesting that this patient is seizure-free despite the fact that we can clearly see a small residual connection. And you almost wonder if somewhat similar to radiosurgery literature, if patients treated with laser ablation, whether complete irreversible uh, cell damage and necrosis is necessary, is it possible that just the thermal injury rendered those pacemaker-like cells in the hematoma uh, inability to generate seizures in this patient? And finally, this patient with a grade three hematoma that we treated about three years ago, you can see in, in a case like this, it would be impossible to treat with one trajectory. So we spent a lot of time planning our approaches. And in this case, we elected to, to do a contralateral approach and cut off the main attachment, which was on the left side in this patient. And we were able to get a good ablation. However, you'll see that uh, despite our best efforts, there is a residual ablation, uh, sorry, a residual connection. And in this patient, we've then gone on to do uh, a second ablation in order to target this residual connection of, of the hematoma to the hypothalamus. And you can see this is the patient the day after surgery. So it really is a minimally invasive uh, approach. Uh, unfortunately, this patient has, has had a recurrence of her seizures and now we're gonna work her up again and potentially perform a third uh, ablation. But because of the limitations in the uh, probe trajectory and shape of the ablation that you can carry out, it's important to, to highlight that many of these patients will benefit from staging of the ablation, which allows you to over time through different procedures, completely ablate the epileptogenic zone while uh, not increasing the morbidity. And, and one final technical nuance that I'd like to bring is that um, when, 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 and this is, pertains to thermodynamics, but um, when you ablate tissue, if there's a bud vessel or if there's a flow of fluid like a CSF space like we have in the third ventricle, the, this acts as a heat sink. And so you're kind of, you might see a trend whereby I have a few cases, and these are two you can see here above on the right and up below, whereby the superior portion right under the, and uh, below the third ventricle, but the superior portion of the hematoma, there's a residual connection. Why? Because despite that our software showed that we probably ablated uh, this uh, connection, in, in reality, there was a, a heat sink. And so no matter how much we increased our, our laser probe, that tissue did not uh, did not uh, um, uh, get subjected to sufficient temperature because of the heat sink in order to destroy it. And so uh, this can be a cause of, of uh, persistent connection and seizure recurrence. The results uh, for laser ablation are, uh, are excellent. 70% uh, of patients seizure free. Uh, however, of course, like all epilepsy surgery, if you follow them long enough, the, the rate of seizure recurrence uh, increases over time. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of long-term data uh, and further studies are warranted. Uh, but the biggest study we have to date was that by uh, uh, Dr. Curry in Texas and uh, just under 60 patients. And uh, he looked at uh, predictors of outcome. Interestingly, the type of hamartoma was not predictive, predictive outcome, although grade four tend to do a bit worse. Uh, but um, his approach is the same that I use here is to stage uh, the stage the ablation for patients with large hematomas, grade threes and, and big grade fours. Um, if the lesion is small, in general, you can get it with one probe, but if the lesion is bigger, you either use, you need to use multiple probes or multiple sessions. Um, really what's important is disconnecting the hematoma from the epileptogenic network at its interface with the mammary bodies and the fornices. And finally, if we compare laser ablation to radiofrequency ablation, the results are somewhat comparable uh, and are also comparable to open surgery and radiosurgery and potentially a little bit better than endoscopic surgery. However, despite it being uh, minimally invasive, it is not without its risks. Uh, and 
uh, here's a, a summary table from our uh, meta-analysis that compared laser ablation to all the other modalities. And you can see that uh, about uh, under 10% of patients have memory deficits, 8% uh, hypothalamic dysfunction, and 5% uh, can have neurological deficits, uh, paresis, or even uh, stroke. So it is not without its morbidity. And certainly the rate of permanent morbidity is higher than what we see with stereotactic radio surgery, albeit lower than what we see with open techniques or endoscopic techniques. Finally, I'd just like to highlight that I think the, 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 the sur surgical approach and the decision-making for these patients is going to benefit a lot from connectomics. And my good friend and colleague, Dr. George Emerman, University of Toronto, uh, put out a nice study, uh, which we contributed uh, patients to, where he, sh uh, he showed that uh, in, in giant hematomas, the, hammer, the, the patients with that, that have uh, um, uh, seizure freedom following ablation uh, had an ablation that was more central and that uh, converged on certain hypothalamic uh, nuclei, as well as uh, limbic structures, particularly uh, limbic pathways. So the fornices and the, and the mammothalamic tract, which of course we know is the pathway, pathway by which uh, seizures are generated in patients with hypertomas. And, and the group in Texas has, has started looking at using resting state functional connectivity networks to uh, guide surgery. And they've actually shown that they've uh, improved seizure, uh, seizure freedom in patients using this technology. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to potentially inc incorporating this uh, in, our, in our practice here as well. And so just to quickly summarize, uh, uh, for this, to uh, think about decision-making in patients with hamartomas, if your patient has a type one hamartoma, so they're pedunculated in the cistern um, or type two intrahypothalamic intra or type three that's combined uh, above and below the tuberculinarium, you, I would consider stereotactic radio surgery as a first line in patients who are, have a stable, relatively stable disease, both in terms of epilepsy and, and uh, cognitive comorbidities. If, they're, if their hematoma is small, less than 50 milliliters, or particularly if they have a normal memory function or if they're older, because they will reap the benefits of the uh, essentially absent uh, uh, memory impairment. Alternatively, uh, also as a potential uh, first line, in patients with type 1, uh, laser or radio frequency ablation, uh, I think would be uh, our first approach here. But if that wasn't available to you, then open uh, approach through terional craniotomy would be would be a good approach for a parahypophyseal para uh, pedunculated hamartoma. Uh, whereas you look at type 2 and type 3, I think the, the first line treatment, uh, uh, if you're not going to consider stereotactic radio surgery, would be uh, stereotactic ablation, either laser ablation or radio frequency ablation. Uh, and I would consider these over endoscopic or open. However, um, endoscopic and open are good alternatives. Uh, patients just need to be counseled to the to slightly higher um, uh, morbidity. Uh, finally, the type fours are really the most challenging group. Uh, no matter what uh, surgical tool you utilize to try and ablate or disconnect them, the seizure freedom rates are, are, are more difficult to, uh, to obtain. And so, in these, we, our approach is to do staged uh, laser ablation, but of course, any combination of approaches, which includes a transcolossal open resection, followed by laser ablation or other combination could be a good uh, avenue for these patients. So um, very quick take home message. Um, I think it's important to, to recognize that the, the hypothalamus can be targeted in the vast majority of patients, but <coughs> important to be aware that some patients with a long disease course do harbor uh, extra hip hypothalamic epileptogenicity, which can become independent and cause seizure uh, persistence. And so in some patients, a very small subset of patients may benefit from more uh, uh, non-invasive or even SCG uh, monitoring. Uh, it's important to uh, uh, refer and recommend surgery uh, within that critical window in order to prevent the progression or development of uh, the uh, encephal uh, epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, of course, we need to uh, use the right surgical approach for the right patient. And uh, in, in about a quarter to half patients, depending on the approach uh, or surgical approach, uh, these patients will benefit from staging. So uh, we counsel patients from the get-go that they may be that they may need in some cases four or five uh, interventions to completely uh, treat their seizures and obtain the benefits. And finally, I think it's important. Uh, especially if you have access to uh, 
several of these tools, but it's important to become knowledgeable uh, and, and garner experience, not just in one technique, but in, in several so that you can offer to, our pati to, the, to these patients uh, um, the, best, the best option to treat their seizures, uh, reduce their morbidity and improve their quality of life. And that's, you know, I have two patients with hematomas that, I, that I've treated over the last few years here. And uh, this is why we do everything we do to try and obtain the best outcomes for these patients. And it's a, it's a privilege to, to, uh, to care for these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I do know I went over and I do apologize, but I'd be Thank you, Alex. That, that was um, a lot to cover. I assume uh, part of uh, my fault to assign such a broad topic for a neurosurgeon. Uh, like a, bri a brilliant neurosurgeon like you. So yeah, so I feel like uh, we are all experts now. I loved the way you traveled from the open surgery to the most recent techniques. Um, um, there is a comment here. Hope we can have easier way for our patients to have surgery done. Yeah, I agree with that. Sometimes in, in some places it's not that easy. Um, yeah, so I loved also your picture of the dependent secondary epilepsy to the independent stage, and that applies to all kinds of uh, epilepsies. I think uh, everybody can understand very easily through that picture that you showed to us. Um, yeah, and uh, I think the, the, big, the main problem here is we know that the outcomes are better if we, patients have a shorter epilepsy history. However, as uh, Dr. Jacobs showed us uh, in the beginning, it might be very, very hard to pick up the seizures. So in many instances, we don't have a, a completely, um, let's say a full history of how long the seizure disorder is going on because of the complexity of the HH, right? Um, yeah, so if there are no comments or questions, um, I will have to move on because we are really over <laughs> our time now. But once again, thank you very, very much. That was very comprehensive. And I feel um, uh, your pictures, your, your personal experience and literature review, this was really good. Okay, thank you.